Good morning, everyone. Um, great to have you back for this uh, third day, I guess. Um, before Jesse gets started, I just had a quick poll to take because it's important for the exercise we're going to do later this morning. How many of you have a device that can write, a pen or a pencil? Does everybody have a pen and pencil? Maybe the opposite. Who doesn't have a pen or a pencil? Okay, so I'll get a, I'll get a couple dozen, but it looks like that's all we would need. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And uh, is it time? Sure, yeah. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> all right, so this morning we're going to start uh, with um, data acquisition, and uh, we have Jesse Meyer. So uh, it's all yours, Jesse. Thanks. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jesse Meyer. I'm a postdoc in the Kuhn Lab. And um, before we get started with the presentation, I want to make a couple comments. So I've distributed envelopes to a few of the tables that are at the front of the table. Those are for an activity that we'll do about 45 minutes in. So just please don't open those yet, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. The other point is I have a lot of uh, links and citations on my slides. Don't worry about jotting those down. We'll make sure that you get copies of all the slides so that you can look at them later. So today I'm going to tell you about uh, mass spectrometry data collection. And I'll break it down into two main strategies, data dependent acquisition, or DDA, and data independent acquisition, or DIA. By the end of this presentation, we'll achieve these learning objectives. You'll understand the different, different ways to collect mass spectrometry data. You'll understand their strengths and weaknesses. And you'll understand when to apply those methods to different biological questions. And you may think, I don't need to worry about how to collect the data. My core facility will do that for me the best way. But that's not always true. A couple of years ago, I was working on a collaboration where our mass spec data suggested to us that we had a difference in RNA splicing. And I'm a mass spectrometrist. I didn't know much about RNA sequencing at the time. But we had some RNA-seq data, and I looked in it for changes in splicing, but I found almost nothing. So at this point, I could have just said, well, I'm wrong. There is no difference in splicing. But actually, I took the time to understand RNA-seq and how it's used to detect alternative splicing. And in fact, we collected more data the proper way and found many interesting differences in alternative splicing. So I think it's important for you as scientists to understand how to collect data the best way with each analytical method that you use to make sure that your research is the most productive it can be. And to help you understand mass spectrometry as an analytical tool for your research and to achieve those learning objectives on the last slide, we'll cover these four points over the next hour or so. First, we'll start with some background. Then I'll go in detail through data-dependent acquisition. Next, we'll cover data-independent acquisition. And then finally, we'll do a fun activity that I hope reinforces these concepts. And we'll look at some case studies that attempt to compare these methods. Starting with the background. Now, recall that modern mass spectrometers that we use for proteomics and metabolomics are actually hybrid instruments that contain multiple mass spec units inside them. So here I'm showing you a cartoon of the inside of a mass spec where we have two quadrupoles in front of a final mass detector. And that last detector, for the purpose of this talk, could be either another quadrupole, which you'd find inside a triple quad, uh, an orbitrap, which is inside a QE, or a time of flight, which you'd find in a QTOF. And it's the presence of these two quadrupoles in front of this last mass detector that allows us to select specific masses or mass ranges for fragmentation before we detect those fragments in the last mass spec stage. And really, this first quadrupole, often referred to as Q1, is really the star of the show here. This is where the magic happens. So what we do in a precursor ion scan is we set Q1 to select a large mass range of all the ions that we might be interested in. For example, 400 to 1,000 m over z might be a useful range for peptides. Q2 is then set to have the gas off, so there's no collision with our peptides and no fragmentation, and we detect those intact peptides in our last mass spec stage. The second type of scan that you'll use is called a fragment ion scan. This is often referred to as tandem MS, MSMS, or MS2 scan. And in this scan, we set the Q1 to select a subset of the mass range. And we use Q2 uh, to collide our peptide with an inert gas and produce fragmentation before we detect those fragments in the last mass spec stage. So from this slide, you can see that the two main differences between an MS1 and an MS2 scan are the range that we select with our Q1 and whether or not we have gas in Q2 to fragment our analyte of interest. And these two types of scans, MS1 and MS2, are combined in various ways to collect your data. And the way that they're combined can be broadly divided into two different camps, DDA and DIA. 
really the main difference between DDA and DIA is how Q1 is used in relation to the data that we're seeing at any moment. For data dependent acquisition or DDA, the MS scan sequence depends on the data. That means that the scans we collect in any run will be at least slightly different than another run, even of the same sample. In DIA, or data independent acquisition, the scan sequence is independent of the data. That means we'll collect the same scans for every analysis, regardless of what the mass spec sees. And both DDA and DIA can be conceptually broken down further into targeted methods, which are for hypothesis testing, and untargeted methods, which are for hypothesis generation. So for example, if, you're, if you have a hypothesis that one protein or a small set of specific proteins are altered in your biological condition, and you want to test that hypothesis, then you would use a targeted method to follow the peptides for that protein or set of proteins. If you don't know which biological, or if you don't know which proteins might be involved in your biological response or your phenotype of interest, then you would use an untargeted DIA or DDA method to discover those changes and follow up on them. Targeted DDA specifically is when we use an inclusion list which contains the masses of peptides we want to monitor to direct data collection. And untargeted DDA is when we collect data collection or when we determine our data collection on the fly based on the most abundant precursor ions that the mass spec sees at any given moment, also known as a top N strategy, where N is the number of peptides we want to monitor every cycle. <laughs> Targeted DIA methods, then, are either selected reaction monitoring, or SRM, which is performed on a triple quadruple, or parallel reaction monitoring, or PRM, which is done on a high-resolution instrument, such as a QTOF or a QExactive. Both of these targeted DIA methods use small Q1 windows to select predefined masses throughout the chromatographic elution gradient. Untargeted DIA, or SWATH then, is when we select and fragment larger predefined mass ranges throughout the elution gradient, which should theoretically fragment all of our peptides of interest. Now this slide gives you an overview of all the topics that we'll cover for the rest of the presentation, so I realize it might be overwhelming right now but I'll explain each of these concepts in more detail, starting with data-dependent acquisition, and specifically targeted DDA. Remember this cartoon of our mass spectrometer with our peptides entering from electrospray ionization on the left? The first scan in the scan cycle of targeted DDA, we have our Q1 set to a wide mass range to allow all the peptides through unfragmented to the final mass spec stage, the orbit trap or the TOF, and this produces our precursor MS spectra, or MS1. The mass spectrometer then compares all the ions that it sees in the precursor spectra to the ions that we've included in the inclusion list, which, remember, contains peptides that we want to monitor. If there are some matches between the precursor spectra and the inclusion list, the mass spectrometer then uses Q1 to select a narrow range around those masses and fragments them in Q2 before we detect them in the last mass spec stage. And this process is repeated for all of the precursors that we find between the inclusion list and the precursor spectra. And each of these scans takes on the order of milliseconds, maybe 50 or 100 or 200 milliseconds. So an entire scan cycle will be done maybe under a second or at most a couple seconds. So each scan cycle is then repeated hundreds of times throughout one analysis. Targeted DDA, or sorry, untargeted DDA starts in the same way with a precursor scan to survey all the ions that we have eluding from the column, produce a precursor spectra. But this time, instead of comparing the ions it sees to a list, the mass spectrometer simply asks, what are the n most abundant precursor signals? It then uses Q1 to select the first of those signals. The Q1 selected precursor goes to Q2, where it's fragmented, and then we detect the fragments in the final mass spec stage to produce our fragment ion spectra. And this is repeated for all the top N ions before we go back to step one and repeat the cycle. And that means uh, that the identification process by DDA is stochastic. Um, and this is one potential weakness of DDA. One way to think about this stochasticity is uh, by imagining what would happen if we repeat analysis of the same sample many times. So here I'm showing you some synthetic data where imagine you run a sample once and you identify a thousand proteins. If you analyze that same sample a second time, you'll find slightly different proteins, some of those complementary. 
So maybe you'll gain 20% unique identifications. If you analyze that sample a third time, maybe you find only another 10%. And a fourth time might give you only another 5%. So although you find different things every time, there are diminishing returns to each additional DDA analysis. Now that you know how DDA works, I want to briefly give you a sense of generally how you'll analyze your DDA data. Although if you're staying for the MaxQuant Summer School later in the week, you'll get this in a lot more detail. The first step in identifying your peptides, or the first step in the analysis is to identify your peptides from your MSMS spectra. And this is a process called peptide spectral matching. And there's really three ways that people do this. The first way is a database search. And this is where you compare your experimental spectra to all theoretical spectra predicted from a database of possible peptides based on the genomic sequence. So a database search requires that you have also have some genomic reference sequence for that organism. The second way is called a spectral library search, and this is where you compare your experimental spectra to a library of all spectra that you've identified previously, probably from another database search. And the last method is de novo, and this is where you look at the fragment spectra and try to piece together what the amino acid sequence should be. And after each of these different options, I've listed a few different software tools that perform each of these types of analysis. Now, for any of these peptide identification methods, we need a way to assign statistics that we've assigned the right peptide to our spectra. And we do this with something called the target decoy approach. And that means that you search for real peptides that you expect should be in your sample, but you also search for shuffled or reversed fake peptide sequences, which should not be there, and those are your decoys. This allows you to determine how often your search finds the wrong answers, which is called your false discovery rate, or FDR. And the way this works is you determine distributions of your target, decoy, or your target hits in green and your decoy hits in red. And that allows you to set a score threshold above which you'll accept any peptide ID at a known proportion of decoy hits. Often we use 1% FDR. After you've identified your peptides and assigned statistics to those identifications, you probably need to infer proteins. So although in bottom-up proteomics we're actually looking at peptides, we need statistically rigorous ways to determine what proteins we found. And it's important to note that you must compute your protein and peptide FDR separately. So 1% peptide FDR will almost always correspond to a higher protein FDR. And there's many different programs to, that will do this for you. A couple examples are Protein Profit and Mayu. And there's actually many different tools. Uh, well, the final step is to quantify your peptides and proteins, and I'll talk about that more in the next slide. Uh, but I want to make the point that there's many different tools that will do each of these steps that are developed academically or commercially. Um, one really great tool is MaxQuant, because it will do all of these steps for you. It puts everything together. But um, I've also given you a citation for an example of a different route that I published earlier this year. Now let's talk a little bit about quantitative DDA strategies, because we'll make a comparison between DDA-based quantification and DIA-based quantification later. The first method is called label-free quantification, or LFQ. And this is where you simply process your control and treatment samples in parallel and then analyze them by mass spectrometry in parallel. And you'll use the intensity of your peptide precursor signal over the chromatographic elution time to assign a quantity to that peptide. So in this example, I'm showing you maybe you're interested in a wild-type mouse versus some gene knockout, but specifically you care about proteins from their liver mitochondria, so you'll isolate the protein, digest them in, with trypsin into peptides, and then analyze those different peptide samples in parallel to generate your gene-regulated proteome data. The other common way to do quantification is with isobaric peptide labeling, for example, using tandem mass tags or TMT. This strategy relies on modification of your peptides with an amine reactive tag. And you'll hear more about this in more detail in the next session. But for this talk, all you need to understand are a couple of points about TMT. The first is that TMT allows you to combine your samples, up to 11 samples, into one sample before you actually analyze them by mass spec. And the second point is that quantification by TMT is actually based on reporter ions that you find in your MS2 spectra instead of based on your precursor spectra, like we would have in LFQ. So to give you a coarse comparison of these two methods, LFQ offers no multiplexing compared to TMT, which gives you up to 11 for 1 multiplexing. But LFQ is the cheapest method because you don't need to buy any expensive isotopes or reagents. 
However, LFQ is the most sensitive to sample preparation or mass spec data collection artifacts. And that's because we have to be sure that we collect our data and prepare the samples identically, which is sometimes not trivial. PMT is less sensitive to these artifacts because we lock in our ratio before we collect the MS data. This slide shows you a real example of LFQ data uh, from the software Skyline. So this is data I collected. Um, and remember that when we collect DDA data, we have periodic MS1 scans as part of the scan cycle. So we can ask the software to plot the signal from our peptide over the elution time. And this is referred to as an extracted ion chromatogram, or EIC or XIC. And what you see here is that the signal from the isotopes of the different peptides eluting over time. So this is the M, M plus 1, M plus 2. Those are just due to natural abundance of C13 and N15. Um, but you'll also notice that there's actually two peaks here that could be the correct peak. There's one at 40 minutes and one at 42 minutes. Um, so which one do we think is correct? How can we know which one is correct? Raise your hand if you think the one on the left is correct. Nobody thinks the one on the left is correct. Raise your hand if you think the one on the right is correct. Raise your hand if you won't raise your hand no matter what I ask. <laughs> All right, well, we'll come back to this example in a minute and I'll reveal the truth. Um, but just think about this for a moment. I also want to make the point that LFQ is resolution dependent and interference dependent. And this is illustrated really nicely in this figure from a recent review. They're showing you how M over Z peak shape and the data extraction window width change from low resolution on the left to high resolution on the right. And these gray peaks are interfering peaks. The red peak is your peak of interest. Green ones are ones that are excluded based on the good resolution and the smaller extraction width. So what you can see is that a higher resolution will give you a, a better peak, a sharper MS peak, and that allows you to use a smaller data extraction window to exclude those nearby masses that would otherwise interfere with your analysis. And in this bottom panel, uh, it shows you how an actual XIC might look on an orbit trap with different resolution settings from 30K up to 500K. And what you notice is that all this noise and the peak shape really cleans up with that higher resolution of the data collection. So does this mean that we should always use the highest resolution setting that we have available? Actually not, because keep in mind that higher resolution on the orbit trap is time dependent. So I think a 500K scan takes at least a second, maybe two seconds, but a 30K scan is somewhere around 50 milliseconds. So if you have really fast chromatography and your peaks elude over a few seconds and you're doing a two second scan, then you're not gonna get a good number of points across that peak. So you really need to match your scan resolution, your scan rate, to the width of your peaks that you're getting chromatographically. And we'll talk about that more in a few slides. Great, so that's it for DDA. Now let's talk about DIA. And we're perfectly on time. Um, starting with targeted DIA. How does it work? Well, the first type of targeted DIA is called selected reaction monitoring. This is performed on a triple quadruple instrument. So instead of having a high res detector in this third box, we have a third quadruple. And this is nice because it gives us really good sensitivity and really good signal to noise. In the simplest example of SRM, where you monitor just one peptide at a time, we use Q1 to constantly select its precursor mass throughout the elution gradient. And we use Q2 to constantly try and fragment that mass. And then Q3 is set to constantly try and monitor one of the fragments that are produced from that reaction. So the term reaction in selected reaction monitoring refers to the conversion of your precursor to your fragments, and selected means you're just monitoring one of those reactions. The other targeted DIA method, parallel reaction monitoring, or PRM, is the same as SRM, except that it's performed on a high-resolution instrument, such as a Q-Exactive or a QTOF. We still park our Q1 on one mass in the simplest example, and we still try to fragment that in Q2, but then instead of following just one of the fragments, with a quadrupole, we measure all of the fragments with high resolution. And then we leverage that high resolution data after we collect it at the data analysis stage to really get good quantitative values. Here's a cartoon of what a PRM scan cycle might look like if you're targeting three peptides. The y-axis here gives you the Q1 selection range in M over Z space, and the x-axis is time. And what you can see is that you select each of the masses for fragmentation in one cycle sequentially, and then you repeat that cycle throughout the gradient. So in this way, the method is independent of the data. We're doing the same scan sequence every time, no matter what we load onto the column. 
And both of these targeted DIA methods actually require that you've previously identified the peptides you're interested in following. And that's so that you know both the retention time and the shape of the MSMS spectra. And these two pieces of information are important because you can imagine that another peptide made of, made of the same amino acids um, would fragment by the same method because it has the same precursor mass. Um, so the only way to know that you've selected the correct peptide for your quantification is to know the relative ratio of the fragments and what they should be, and also know where that peptide should elute in time. Now let's back up a step and talk generally about how you'd actually perform targeted DIA. As I said, you'd first need to collect DDA uh, with the sample that should contain your protein or proteins of interest to generate that spectral library with your retention times and your MSMS shapes. Once you've found your peptides of interest, um, I suggest using a software called Skyline and you can import your IDs, your search results into Skyline, and that'll help you build a targeted method. And we don't have time to go into those details, so I'm just giving you links to how you would do this for PRM or SRM. Um, there's tutorials, there's great tutorials from that group. Um, the next step, this is an optional but preferred step, is that you should purchase stable isotope labeled standard peptides. And this is important because it allows you to monitor any variation that occurs due to sample preparation or differences in instrument sensitivity over your data collection time frame. So what you do is you spike the standard peptide into your samples as early as possible um, so you can account for the most variation, the most technical variation. Once you have your standard peptide and your targeted method, um, you'll spike that peptide into your samples and you'll actually analyze your samples with the targeted method. And then again, you can use Skyline to re-import that targeted DIA data and manually assess your peak integrations and do your quantification. And if you have a lot of peaks, then you can actually do this with statistics instead of having to look at all of those peaks with a tool called MProfit. So Skyline is a great tool. I encourage you to get familiar with it. Finally, that leaves us with untargeted DIA, sometimes called SWATH. Um, here, instead of selecting a small precursor mass range, as we did for these targeted methods, we actually select these large precursor mass ranges of 2 to 200 m over z. Um, and these precursor ranges almost certainly contain multiple peptides. So we co-fragment those multiple peptides in Q2, and we create these complex chimeric spectra in our high-resolution detector. To better understand how targeted and untargeted DIA are different, let's compare the scan sequence of PRM with a scan sequence of untargeted DIA. So remember this graph on the left where I showed you this cycle of repeating Q1 selection for specific peptides over the elution time. In contrast, our untargeted DIA method often includes an MS1 scan where the Q1 selects the entire mass range of interest and we measure those peptides intact. But this MS1 scan is then followed by several wider Q1 selection windows for MS2. So we fragment everything that should be coming off the column, or at least everything that's in our MS1 range of interest. So hopefully from this comparison, it's clear how untargeted DIA results in fragmentation of everything that's coming off your column. Now coming back to this LFQ trace that I told you was from DDA. Um, we, we didn't know which peak was, at least we didn't get enough responses to know which peak was the correct peak. Um, and it's kind of hard to tell based on the MS1 peak alone. But because I actually used untargeted DIA to collect this data, we can look at the XIC traces from the fragment ions over time, and we can easily see which peak is the correct peak. And when we do this, we can in fact see that the peak on the right is correct, because the other peak has none of the correct fragment ion signals. And this highlights one of the values of DIA, which is that instead of having to pick through an often crowded precursor ion space, we can look at the fragment ion space and use many different options for identification and quantification. So although this data is actually from untargeted DIA, this is how your data might also look from PRM. Um, and SRM would be similar, except you would monitor only a few of the most intense transitions that you expect. So the proposed advantages of DIA then over DDA are all related to data completeness. Theoretically, we should fragment all of the peptides in our sample and that should lead to less stochastic identifications and less sample-to-sample -sample variability to make comparisons easier. But what I didn't tell you is that DIA requires a spectral library of your peptide identifications with retention times. And usually this library is generated from data that you collect previously with DDA. So often people will take a small portion of each sample combine it into a pooled sample, extensively fractionate that with SCX or high pH reverse phase, and then analyze each of those fractions with DDA 
to generate a sample-specific spectral library. There's also a number of publicly available spectral libraries, or if you find a paper that uses a spectral library, you can reuse that. Um, for example, there's a library of 10,000 human proteins from the Abersold lab, and that's really nice if you're working on cultured human cells or any tissues from humans, like plasma. But generally, sample-specific libraries outperform these public libraries at the expense of more data collection time. Now let's talk about how you would actually perform untargeted DIA. First, you need to determine your chromatographic peak width and your mass spec scan speed. And this is because you need to ensure that you match that scan rate to your peak width to make sure you can get at least 10 measurements across your peak. Some people say 5, some people say 15, I say 10. And to illustrate this point here, I'm showing you a cartoon of a peptide peak that might result from standard HPLC analysis with 3 micron C18 particles. Under these conditions, you might expect a peptide to elude over about 30 seconds. So to ensure 10 scans across this peak, our scan cycle could be as long as 3 seconds. However, if you have UPLC and you're using sub-2 micron C18 particles, then your peptide peak width is going to be a lot more narrow and a little bit taller sometimes six seconds or less. So if we use the same three second scan cycle to try and collect data on this peak, we'd be lucky if we got two points across that peak. So when we decrease our peak width, we also need to decrease our MS scan cycle time. Um, in this case, we would need to use a scan cycle time of about 0.6 seconds. So to determine the maximum number of scans to ensure 10 points per peak, it's simple. You just look at the time that your peptide elutes over, divide that by 10. So in the last example, that was 0.6 seconds. Then we can use this equation to determine how many MS2 windows we're going to use for our untargeted DIA method. So their total cycle time equals how long our MS1 scan takes plus how long our MS2 scan takes times the number of windows. This is just the form of Y equals MX plus B. So in our example, if we know that our MS1 cycle takes 125 milliseconds and each MS2 scan is 25 milliseconds, we can easily do the math and figure out that maximum we can have 19 MS2 windows to make sure we sample our peaks enough for a good quantitation. Once you know how many peaks, or sorry, how many scan windows you can have, then you need to design the scan widths that you're going to use. And the simplest way to think about this is to just use fixed scan widths. So if we're interested in 400 to 1,000 m over z, that's 600 m over z units. We just divide that by 19, and we know that each window would be 32 m over z. But a better way to do this is actually to use variable width windows and, and base those on the precursor density, because it's actually not uniform across the space. And um, an example of this was published in 2015 uh, called Swath Tuner, and they have a website, and this is a link to the publication. And here I'm showing you a figure from the Swath Tuner paper where they have plotted the number of ions per DIA window on the y-axis against m over z on the x-axis for both the fixed and the variable width strategy. And you can see that with the fixed windows, we have a lot more analytes in some of these windows than we do in other windows. In contrast, the variable windows are defined as using the same number of peptides in every window, and they achieve this by making more narrow windows in those regions that are really busy. So I definitely recommend that you uh, use this variable window strategy. And they showed that, actually, if you use variable windows, you can get about 10% more peptide and protein IDs. And those IDs have better quantitative metrics. Um, and they have a website where you can go and enter all of your precursor masses of interest. So if you do make a bunch of DDA scans, you can enter a list of the m over z values you want to follow. It'll produce these nice plots for you. You can put them in your lab notebook, and then you can make the best method to collect data for your sample. And okay, now let's talk a little bit about how you'll analyze your uh, DIA data. So in the same way that we had to first identify peptides for DDA, we do the same thing for DIA, except it's a little bit different because instead of having these discrete snapshots of MS2 spectra, we have these chromatograms of our fragments eluding over time. So what you do is you actually um, extract these chromatograms, look at the ratios of the fragments, and you assign some score that you found the correct ratio of fragments at the correct time in elution gradient. There's also actually at least one program that will try to do spectra spectrum matching. Um, but for either of these methods, you need to still compute your FDR with a target decoy approach. And that's done the same way. So we extract chromatograms for our targets, but we also extract chromatograms for fake targets or for decoys. And then we assign some statistics to our identifications. <clears throat> 
Next, you also need to infer your proteins, and this can be done the same way once you have your identifications, the same way that you did it for DDA. And then finally, we do our quantification and we test for significance among our conditions. Um, quantification is a little bit different here because uh, identification and quantification are really linked in DIA because you have to extract the ion signal to identify something. So basically, anything you've identified, you've also quantified. And here's a list of the main tools that people use to analyze their DIA data. Um, I told you that you can use Skyline for DDA, MS1-based quantification. You can use it for PRM, SRM, but you can also use it for DIA. So it's a really great, versatile software tool. It has a nice graphical interface. You can even use it for metabolomics data. Um, the original DIA analysis tool was OpenSwath, and this works great. It's just command line based, so it's a little harder to use. Uh, these next two are software that you have to pay for from vendors. Um, PeakView I don't really recommend. It's kind of slow, and it doesn't find as much stuff as the other ones. Um, Spectronaut is actually really great if you're doing a lot of DIA. I'd encourage you to try to get Spectronaut or get a trial of Spectronaut because it's really easy. Um, and this last one is called DI Umpire. I have this colored differently because it works a little differently. All these other ones require a spectral library up front. DI Umpire doesn't. So they're all based on XICs, but DI Umpire works a little differently, and I'll explain that in a minute. I mentioned there's also at least one spectral library search tool. This is called MSplit DIA. Um, it works well, but you just get identifications. It's not linked to quantification like the uh, XIC-based tools. And then finally, there's at least a couple tools for PTM analysis of DIA data. One of those is called Peaked, which I published, and then the other one's called Thesaurus, which is still in BioArchive, presumably under review. So let's compare these five main DIA software analysis tools. I'm showing you a panel from a figure from a 2016 Nature Biotech paper here, where they're looking at the unique peptides on the left and the unique proteins on the right from each of those five XIC-based tools. Um, and what you can see is that they all sort of find the same thing, except for DI Umpire. Uh, DI Umpire finds a few different things, and then it misses out on a bunch of stuff that the other tools found. And remember, I told you this is the only one that doesn't require a starting spectral library. So how does that work? It's actually pretty interesting. So instead of starting down here with the spectral library and extracting signals, they extract signals, look for correlation between the precursor and fragment signals, and if there's enough correlation, they assemble those precursors and fragments into pseudo-MSMS spectra. And this was published in 2015 by Alexei Nesvinsky's group in, in Michigan. Um, so this uh, strategy produces pseudo-MSMS spectra that you can then uh, plug right into your favorite database search algorithm for DDA analysis and identify your peptides. And this strategy that allows you to do uh, DIA only instead of doing the strategy where I told you you'd collect DDA in parallel to make a spectral library, this is beneficial when you have a really low amount of protein per sample or if you have a really large number of samples, maybe you just want to get them all through with DIA. Um, now, although DIA Empire works well for protein level identification and quantification, PTM analysis has additional requirements. For example, we need some way to assign a score that we've correctly localized our PTM and our peptide. So in this example, there's a phosphorylation we know, but we don't know if it's at this T or this S and we want to assign a score to which one we think is correct. We also would like to have a way to roll up multiple measurements of the same PTM into a site level measurement. So in this example, we found two charge states of this peptide containing the same modification. We also found a missed cleavage of this peptide. So we want to combine these three different measurements into just one site level measurement. And then finally, it'd be nice if there was a way to do some correction for differences in protein abundance. Because you can imagine finding an increase in a PTM of fivefold, but if you also saw an increase in that protein of fivefold, then you really haven't found a regulated PTM. It's still the same proportion on that protein. But if you find an increase in a PTM and the protein doesn't change, then you found a truly regulated PTM site. And uh, so I built something that does exactly this. It uh, performs PTM identification and quantification from exclusively DIA. And we call this peaked. Um, and the way that this works is it automates every step in the analysis using tools from the community. And I won't go into too many details, but briefly it allows you to put in your DIA data and get back your sites and whether or not they've changed among your conditions. Um, and you do this through a simple graphical user interface. And we showed in the paper that it's reproducible, accurate, and sensitive. And we also showed in the paper that you can use this to look at other people's DIA data 
and find PTMs in their data, even if they didn't enrich for them. So we looked at this data set where people went to the ER with abdominal pain, um, and they looked at just proteomics in their urine. But we reanalyzed that data looking for phosphorylation, and we found some interesting changes um, in phosphorylation. Some of those were associated with specific diagnosis like UTI. All right, so that's it for the DIA, the DDA, and the background. Now we're going to do that puzzle activity that I mentioned. Um, so I hope this uh, reinforces the concept. And uh, before we do this, uh, let's go over the rules and the goal. So the goal here is to assemble the puzzles as fast as possible and record your time. And the rules are uh, you should wait until I tell you to start. Keep the envelope intact. Don't tear it apart. We want to put the puzzles back in there afterwards. Um, I want you to break into teams of three or four. I didn't have enough puzzles for every table, so if you have envelopes, could you raise your hand so people can see if a neighboring table has envelopes? So if you don't have envelopes, try to slide over to form a team of three or four uh, with another team that does have envelopes. Um, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. You can just watch what other people are doing if it's too early. Um, and when you finish, come and report your time to me. And um, feel free to work together. So. Does everyone, I'll, I'll give you a second to organize yourselves. This is, all right, does everyone have puzzles and a space to work on them? Don't start yet, don't start yet. Make sure that you have a space to work. It looks like we got two puzzles over here with extra room if you need someone. Does everyone have a phone out to time themselves? All right. It looks like most people are ready. So go. Done? What, which puzzle did you have? Uh, DDA or DIA? Well, could you come up when you're done and tell me how long it took? It would be easier than shouting. Oh, no. <laughs> 144? Um, what is that in seconds? Like 104? <laughs> Okay. A minute and 58 seconds for DD. So like 118? Uh, 153 for DDA. 204 for DDA. And then we should do the DIA once. Minutes or seconds? Uh, 204 minutes. 2 minutes, 4 seconds. So 124. 
or 135, right? We also got DDA at 2 minutes 26. So it's 156. It's 122 seconds, DDA. Okay, 122, thank you. DIA, yeah. two minutes and nine seconds? Or seconds? Um, was it the time to complete both? No, just to complete the one. Just one of them? Well, two yeah, yeah. Okay. Is that in seconds? Let or? Yeah, okay. Yeah. We have DDA sequence, um, two minutes and 13 seconds. So did you do the both of the puzzles or just one? We only had one puzzle in our... Oh, in DDA. Yeah. It's two minutes and how many? 13. So 133, right? Thank you. DDA, 94 seconds. 94 seconds, okay. All right, two minutes and 46 seconds. For DIA? DIA. Okay, 246. Yeah, we'll finish it with two minutes and 14 seconds. The For which one? The bigger one. The, the DDA. Or whatever. How many the puzzles? Big, the bigger the bigger envelope. How many puzzles did you assemble? Two. Two puzzles? How Three long? Three extra. So one has like one, the other has two. Yeah. Okay. How so long did it take for the envelope with two? Uh, did you do them separate? Three minutes separate? and fourteen seconds. Yeah, Three, we did them separate. Yeah. Okay, so. And the other one, two minutes. I'll just say like one ninety-four seconds. Yeah. And then one hundred and twenty. One hundred and twenty. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we have one twenty for the DBA. One twenty. Thank you. You want them in seconds? Seconds, please. Yeah, the DBA was. Um, uh, one uh, twenty-four. Okay. And the other one was two oh seven. Two oh seven. Okay. Yeah. DDA was one forty, and then DIA was two hundred. One forty. Two hundred. Two hundred. They only have the DIA, but three minutes and fifty seconds. Three fifty. So what is that in seconds? Oh gosh. Two forty. Two thirty. Something like that. Two thirty. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, so two minutes fifty eight seconds. What's that? I was seventy eight. For DA? Yeah, DA yeah. one seventy eight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we're DA at four minutes and twenty one seconds. Okay, so that's how many seconds? Two hundred and forty six roughly. Four minutes and how many seconds? Uh, 21. Oh. So would it be 261? Yeah, 261. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And we took uh, two and a half minutes. So 150? Okay. That's fast. Good job. Thank you. DD took four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. 240. We got 180 seconds for. for DDA or DIA? DIA. DIA, 180? Okay. Okay. 167 and 247. 147. Okay. So that's 164. Thank you. Yeah. It worked. So what's the what's the rationale here? We'll break it down now. Okay, all right. Yeah, break it yeah. Down. we'll make sure. Explain this yeah, yeah, we're gonna explain. He it. says it's working the way yeah. he picked it, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be interesting because I can't figure out why one of these. Right, there's a puzzle. Okay. I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> Hello? 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 Okay. All right, we got most of the groups done, so let's um, analyze this real quick and then we'll move on. Uh, so you can see the results here. This worked as I hoped it would. That's great. Um, you can see that there's a statistically significant difference between the two groups. So the DDA group um, took, I don't know, maybe 120 seconds on average, and the DIA group took about 210 seconds on average. Um, so this is exactly what I had hoped for, actually. Let me put this into the PowerPoint. Um, okay. Let's, let's talk about what just happened. <laughs> 
So um, the envelope unpacking was meant to represent your data collection, and the puzzles were meant to represent your data. Um, and I was hoping that this would help us understand the strengths and weaknesses between DDA and DIA. Um, so let me just ask you guys, what do you think about which strategy was better? Depends on what you want to do. Does anyone have any strong feelings that one was better than the other? No? Okay. DDA was faster, yeah. So let's, let's just break it down step by step. Which envelope took longer to unpack? It was about the same, right? They, either envelope takes the same amount of time to open. So data collection by DDA or DIA should take about the same amount of time just to select the ions with the Q1. Which envelope was more complicated to assemble? DIA, obviously, right? So as with any newer method, DIA is generally harder to set up and analyze, but it's getting easier all the time. So which envelope contained more peptides? DIA, obviously, right? So although DDA was less complicated, uh, we got more information from our DIA analysis. And that's one of the trade-offs. So if you're willing to do a little more work, um, maybe DIA can be beneficial for you, okay? Um, and to really hammer home the difference, just one final slide to hammer home the difference between DDA and DIA. Um, here I'm showing you a scan map of DDA um, on the top left. Uh, where we have our MS1, Q1 window here in purple, and then our MS2 windows in red. Uh, so remember that what you do in DDA is the mass spectrometer surveys all the ions, fragments the top N, and then repeats that cycle. Um, and we use our favorite spectral search algorithm to identify peptides from DDA, and then we can get quantification from our precursor signal. DIA, in contrast, we still survey all of the precursor ions, but instead of asking the mass spectrometer to fragment all the most intense precursors, we ask it to fragment larger predefined mass ranges every cycle, sometimes called swaths. So instead of these discrete spectra from DDA, we get these complex chimeric spectra. Um, and this can be difficult to identify, but the benefit is that we measure peptide fragments across their elution time, giving us several measurements that we can use for quantification. But DIA requires a library of uh, a spectra that we've already identified. Um, the next point that I really want to emphasize is the importance of these three related variables. Um, so remember, uh, we need to match our scan rate to our chromatography, and our scan rate is intimately tied to the resolution that we set. And this is important for either DDA or DIA. And to emphasize this point, I'm showing you an unfair comparison uh, that I did between DDA on accident. Uh, DDA and DIA on accident. Um, so a few months after I joined the Kuhn Lab, I wanted to see whether DDA or DIA is better on the equipment we have here. Um, and I ran a standard HeLa digest with a 30-minute method by either DDA or DIA. And I analyzed the data, and I found a few things with DDA, but I found almost zero things with DIA. And that really surprised me, because at my last postdoctoral position, DIA routinely did much better than DIA, or DIA did much better than DDA. So I imported the results into Skyline, and I was surprised to realize that the problem was actually really high-quality chromatography. So you can see here with this 30-minute analysis, our peaks are actually shorter than six seconds. Um, and that means that even with this one-second scan cycle, I was lucky to get two or three points across the peak with DDA. Um, when I looked at the DIA, I had tried to set up a two-second scan cycle, but I had accidentally set up a four-second scan cycle. So I was... Uh, getting one point per peak, and actually in this third replicate, I didn't even hit the peak at all. So I hope it makes really clear that you need to match your scan rate to your peptide chromatography. Um, finally, let's just go over a couple case studies to compare, uh, that attempt to compare DDA and DIA. So here I'm showing you part of a figure from a 2018 JPR paper. Um, and in this paper, they did similar to what I did, they did one microgram of HeLa with DDA or DIA on the new QExactiv HFX. And what they found is that DDA gave them about 4,000 proteins, 25,000 peptides. But actually with DIA, they identified 55,000 peptides and about 50% more proteins, almost 6,000 proteins. Um, so how is that possible? Uh, here I'm showing you a figure from another paper that might answer that question. So this figure compares the number of spectra collected um, or the peptides identified on the y-axis with the length of the analysis gradient here on the x-axis. And this red line is the IDs from DIA, 
This dotted line is the theoretical number of spectra that you could collect with DDA. And this blue line is the actual number of spectra that you collect with DDA. Um, and these two are IDs from DDA. So what's really interesting here is you can see that you actually identify more peptides with DIA at these really short gradients than it's even possible to collect in MSMS spectra. So that means that we're identifying more than one thing per spectra. And that makes sense from what I told you about uh, how you analyze the data. Um, remember, I also told you briefly about TMT earlier as a quantitative DDA strategy. Um, so this, this slide shows you an excerpt from a recent paper where they tried to compare DIA with uh, DDA plus TMT. Um, DDA with TMT is maybe one of the leading quantitative strategies from the DDA camp. Um, and they concluded that the TMT workflow led to 15 to 20 percent more identified proteins and slightly better quantitative precision whereas the quantitative accuracy was better for the DIA method. So it seems that TMT plus DDA is maybe a little better for depth, but overall they're kind of similar in what you can do with them. The last thing you need to think about uh, when you're comparing these quantitative strategies is cost. So if you have a really high cost per LCMS run, um, for example, if you're going to a company, actually I recently looked at some websites, it's not unreasonable that they'll charge you more than $1,000 for one LCMS analysis. So if you're paying $1,000 for a run and you need to run 10 samples, that's going to cost you $10,000 in DIA. Um, but if you put them all together with TMT, then this $4,000 for the TMT reagent isn't so bad and you're actually cheaper in the end doing TMT. But if you're in an academic setting and you're probably paying a lot less than that per run, you need to do a lot of runs, then maybe this cost for this TMT reagent is prohibitive um, and you actually do better by just getting a bunch of runs. So that's something to think about also when you're trying to decide what strategy you want. Um, and then this is the last slide. Uh, I'd like to finish with a comparison of the strengths and the weaknesses of each method. And this, is, this isn't just my opinion. Um, I went to Twitter and I asked people uh, who are practitioners in the field and have performed both methods. And I wanted to see what they thought. And overwhelmingly, uh, the first thing that people said was it really depends on the scientist that's doing the analysis and the equipment that they have. So you should probably listen to your core. If they say we're not good at that, listen to them. Um, but uh, it was also pretty clear that the total proteome depth you can get with DDA and TMT is definitely greater than what you can get with DIA. Um, but DIA is better in the number of proteins you get per hour, but most of those are repeat identifications of the same thing. Um, and it's also better in cost and the ease of sample prep. Uh, people said that there's less missing values with TMT within the batch, within the 10plex or 11plex, because whenever you fragment a peptide, you're going to get a reporter ion for that peptide. Um, but they also said that DIA was better for undepleted plasma um, and that it had a better dynamic range and better reproducibility across different batches of samples. And I can tell you from personal experience, if you're using a QTOF from SciX, then it's almost no comparison. You should probably go with DIA. All right, so that's it. It looks like we have some time for questions or we can start the break early. Or if you want to email me your questions or find me on Twitter or LinkedIn, you can do that also. Question, I'll bring you the microphone. Where? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for a really nice talk. I'm wondering about this um, peak ed, uh, method that you mentioned about uh, PTMs, where you could uh, really uh, correct uh, uh, PTMs for protein expression. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is the overlap between proteins and PTMs more in your samples more usually? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I can tell you a lot of the PTM sites you don't find the protein for when you do a parallel analysis looking for protein. I don't know the exact number, um, but usually I just throw out the ones that I don't have a protein measurement for because I really want to know the relative PTM amount, not just whether the PTM changed. But it's, sorry. Is it possible to do it or if you don't have the proteome data, like you just have the PTM data? No, this requires that you had proteome data. So separately from non-enriched peptides, you'd have to also collect data. Okay, yeah. Do you have an idea of um, the performance of these machine learning generated spectral libraries like ProSit, how that's performing? It's a very new thing, but I'm just curious to see if you've tried it. I haven't personally tried it. I know some people that are trying it, especially the guy at uh, UC Davis, Brett Finney. He's making libraries for people if they want them. 
uh, with pros that he's got it installed locally. So you could reach out to him and get his opinion, but I think it works pretty well, actually. They showed in the paper that the spectra they generate are as good as repeat measurements of the same peptide uh, from technical measurements. So I think it works quite well. I think it's a little early to tell, but it looks really promising and exciting. Yeah. yeah. Got another question here. Um, hi. Is there a reason that the swaths go from low mass to high mass and not the other way around? Oh, um, I don't think so. I'm not the right person to ask. I think, I don't really remember if I set them from high to low or low to high. Um, I don't know if it matters. Is there a reason that a quadrupole would work better in one direction? Not that I can think of. I don't think it should matter. I was just wondering about when you tune the the width of your um, isolation windows in DIA for uh, based on what like the ion density is in that window. Uh -huh. Is that something you have to run your sample beforehand and predetermine? I assume you're not the instrument's not doing it on the fly or, or anything no, like that. Yeah, you would you would do that with uh, DDA data that you had collected previously, or if you had a spectral library, then you could just catalog the M over Z values for precursors in the spectral library. And then assume that, you know, your retention time for everything is going to be very reproducible and then you would just... That's actually independent of the retention time. You okay. need to know that separately. But the width of the windows is independent of the retention time where they'll come out. Nobody's really scheduling windows differently for untargeted DIA yet. That's an interesting idea, actually. Okay. Okay, before we go on break, I wanted to, um, uh, we have uh, this, um, I promised an award every day for the best tweet. So uh, I picked one. Hold on. All right, so the suspense is driving crazy. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I thought we had a great day. The poster session was phenomenal. It's, uh, so much diverse science here, people from all over. It was really great to see uh, an email come through to the list of all of you that there was an event going on that you guys self-assembled down at the union, so that's fantastic. There were a ton of great tweets. Um, to choose from, so it was really hard. So if you didn't win today, uh, keep at it. Um, or yesterday, maybe you can win today. So here's the one that uh, that we picked. Um, by, uh, Navi, yeah? Uh, yep. Uh, this thing here is what enables me to collect so much amazing data. Who knew something so small could be so transformative? Now I can tell my PI how the instrument works all the time. Uh, and, and this photo here was from our demo area. Uh, and so you, uh, you, you all got to handle these parts, so that's really cool. So come on up, and uh, we've got a $25 gift card for you. Uh, so let's, uh, we'll, we'll, take a, we'll take a break and reconvene here. Um, at what time does it say? 10? Hold on. 10 o'clock, yeah, all right. So you got a little bit longer, um, can, uh, the posters are still up so we can mingle out there and uh, see you in a bit. <laughs>